Hey, Donna. We'll give it just a minute. Folks are still just jumping in. How's the day, Donna? Not too bad. Have some frustration with the seller, but, you know, it comes what? with the territory. What's going on with your seller? Oh, my goodness. She just... Oh. It's a long story. <laughs> What's the short version? Uh, the short version is that I got an I got an offer on it's the triplex here in Doris. I got an offer on her property yesterday. And oh yeah. She doesn't, she doesn't want to accept it. She wants to reject it outright because she has two potential offers um, for cash for closer to her asking price. Okay. Nothing's in hand. I mean, it's it's a potential kind of thing. So she wants to sell her property up here and buy something down in the Bay Area. And, and But she doesn't want to do 1031 exchange, and she doesn't want to have to deal with capital gains, which there really shouldn't be much. Um, what she wants to happen, ideally, is someone to buy the property down there for her and, uh -huh. then, switch, and then switch the two properties out. Trade Trade property. That's confusing as all get out. I know. And and I told her, I said, I am not comfortable with that. I do not recommend it for you. I will not recommend it for any of my clients. So. Is she an <laughs> owner-occupied person? No. Okay. So, I mean. No. That's oh, a, on, that's a phone great way to look at it, it, which is, you know, getting her to talk about tax liability and um, what that looks like. and. You know, even though we may not be talking about capital gains specifically, you know, there are ways to look at it that um, give her a more effective way of transitioning um, from one property to the next. What's the value of the triplex? Hey, Ian. What's the value of the triplex, Donna? So it's listed for 275 The value on it is closer to 225 right now okay. because she refuses to fix it or, you know, give it a facelift or anything okay <clears throat> and and I, lo I lost part of your conversation because i had an incoming call so uh, but anyway oh, got, it. got it so no i was just saying so i mean you know that's part of what we talk about today you know so this is all about kind of deal negotiation and such and kind yeah. of different levels of what we do what so her ultimate is what is to sell this property buy a new property or at least exchange for a new property in an, in another location. Yeah. Uh, what's her aversion to uh, tax deferred exchange? I I don't know. I don't know. I've I've had this. I've had conversations with her over and over again, and and she just she's old, <laughs> and she's set in her ways, and she's got her mind that this is what she wants to do. Yeah. And she's had the property listed with several different agents, and she's trying to sell it for sale by owner. So she has a way she wants to do it, and she is basically refusing any other way. So let me throw something. So are you familiar with what's called the zone of acceptability? Is that familiar to you? Uh, it sounds like it should be. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you're cute. <laughs> it sounds like it should be. Um, you know, it, it, And you're right. It should be, right? And, you know, that that's kind of a great kickoff into what we're talking about when we talk about negotiation. You know, there's never a truly straightforward negotiation. Sometimes we have deals that are much easier to manage and much more um, straightforward um, to where there's very little negotiation. But, you know, when we get into ones that have a little bit more layered um, uh, uh, behavior to it, you know, that's when we kind of really start to understand where we are or where we are not. Mm -hmm. And this is one of those ones. So I'm glad we're talking about this one, uh, Donna is we can look at, so what the what the zone of acceptability is, and that runs on both sides of the, negotiation, of the negotiation, by the way. You know, the zone of acceptability is what works for the seller, what works for the buyer. You know, it's just more of a, a fancier term. So when we talk about concepts of negotiation, which is what this is, right now where we're falling to is the zone of acceptability for the seller. And where the problem lies is that the seller truly hasn't identified what their wants or needs are yet. Even though she says surfacely, oh yeah, this is what I want. You know, by your own statement, she's had multiple um, uh, she's had multiple agents. 
Um, she's had offers that she hasn't accepted. She has an offer now in hand that she's flat out refusing. The and, and the the crucial thing that you said, which really strikes a chord with me, and it's not so much age specific as it is lack of knowledge. So she said, "Oh, I can get this thing," and in when we start talking about a zone of acceptability for a person like this, it's a matter of. Um, what you're willing to accept as a practitioner to assist her and where you're drawing your line. Sometimes yeah. it's, it's a, um, it's a, it's a putting your foot down kind of thing. There's this other statement that we call uh, price quality heuristics that it's like when we buy something, we don't know the quality of what we're buying without buying it in a sense. Right. That's kind of where she's at. She doesn't, fully understand the quality or value of you as a practitioner until she buys it. And now you're kind of pushing through it. So what we talk about this when we talk about objection handling all the time, why, uh, what's the reason why um, she's not making a true decision, Donna? She doesn't have enough information to make one. Right. And it may seem like you've given her everything, but we know that uh, in order for someone to make a decision, an informed decision, we have to give them the right amount of information. And that's, you know, that's half our battle. Right. We that's what we do every day is we help people to make an informed decision for her right now. And it could be due to age. It could be due to some experiences that she's had, both positive and negative in terms of transacting real estate. It could be that she's having some confusion around actually what her true tax implications may or may not be, all those things. And she's wanting to, in a sense, oversimplify. That's why I said, you know, to have somebody just buy the property that she wants and then they just exchange. Yeah. Sure, that can be done. But what a friggin' nightmare when there are so many more easier processes that could help her, help her to accomplish the same thing. So as you're looking at the quality of you, which is very high, you need to help her understand what you're trying to articulate to get this deal done. It's not so much of you forcing her to say, hey, Mr. or Mrs. Seller, you know, this is a great deal. You should take it. It's not that at all. It's more specifically, this is what's on the table for you and this is why. And here are your best options if we're wanting to move this forward. One of the facts is, is as an elderly person, this is going to sound very insensitive, but it's true, and it's true of all of us, is, you know, we can count our summers on one hand sometimes the older we get, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and if she's trying to accomplish a specific task for family legacy or for um, just uh, her remaining years, the comfort of her remaining years, that sort of thing, that's when we need to really be more insistent on the process that may work best for her. Because it doesn't sound like, at least to me, as you stated, it doesn't sound like she has a clue as to the direction she needs to drive. Is that kind of what you're feeling as well? It really does. And she's even expressed to me that if she doesn't get the deal the way she wants it, she's just gonna give the property to her son and let him deal with it. It's okay, that, that will not get you what you want. <laughs> And I've, well, I've explained it so many times, the things that, you know, the best way to do everything. And it's like, she's not even hearing me. She doesn't care. She wants it this way. And that's the way it is. Well, you just brought up something brilliant, which is, you know, sometimes we think we're aligned with the decision maker and we're not. You know, the fact that she stated that, uh, you know, screw it. If I can't do what I want to do, I'll give it to my son and let him take care of it. He may be, you know, based on her age. So, you know, I can give you a very real world example. I take care of all of my parents' affairs, both financially, you know, I mean, I support my parents. So, uh, but I take care of all their affairs, left and right. You know, and they're constantly going, see my son. Oh, geez. Uh, what? You know what I mean? And that's, that's what happens when our parents are elderly. But this may be a case to where you're not aligned. Again, this is that price heuristic thing. I was just, price quality heuristic I was sharing with you, which mm -hmm. is she doesn't know the value of you. She's had a lot of you, a lot of practitioners that you know came to the table and said, "Oh, this seems simple," when in fact there's a little bit more layered or a little more complexity to it. So it might be that as you're looking to align with her on what needs to happen to move forward. 
is to align with the son. Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Seller, you know, I'd love to meet your son and talk openly about this. That way we can all get aligned to see what next steps may look like. And the son may be the voice of reason or her offspring. It may not just be the son, but, you know, he may be the voice of reason or her extended family may be that voice of reason that says, oh, yeah, this is where we're wanting to go. Yes, this makes sense, Donna. Let's do X or let's do Y. And you have to be careful as we execute that type of negotiation or strategy only because if there are multiple people in the family and everybody wants to jump in and have a seat at the table, then it can get very convoluted, very confusing. And, you know, everybody's just kind of going, no, we should do this because they've all got a stake in it from a financial perspective. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So, you know, as we kind of get back to it, just to summarize what we talked about, we're not exactly in her zone of acceptability. And it's only because, not anything that you've done as a practitioner, but it's only because she doesn't have enough information to make an informed decision. And she might not be the decision maker, even though her name is on the title. Um, I mean, just very telling, multiple realtors, it's not a it's not a super expensive property, right? If it was a you know ten gazillion dollar property, then you can see where there's complexity. But there's probably going to be very little to no tax implication, you know, very little to no capital gains, you know, a lot of things that probably won't impact her in a way that she may or may not be thinking. Um, but you know, if the proceeds are meant for an offspring. Um, anyway, if they're meant for an heir anyway, it's probably best to bring him in now versus later. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So I have another question that's kind of related. So sure. Because she's looking at, she's also got it listed for sale by owner. And my contract is not that. My contract is, uh, you know. Exclusive. exclusive. Yeah. Exclusive, right. So uh, yeah, if, for sure. If he does sell it on the side, how do I... How do I force the issue and get a commission out of her? You don't. Okay. So that's the beauty of working with a for sale by owner. I, you know, in my early days in my career, when I was practicing full time, um, I did, I used to, my bread and butter were for sale by owners and expired. I did a boat ton of them. I would have used another word, but a boat ton works just as well. <laughs> I did a ton of them. And literally I suggest that to agents now, which is if you want to get, a for sale by owner, get them into an exclusive uh, agency contract. And the, the beauty of that is you're still letting them do their thing. They're still saying, hey, I want to sell this by myself. You're right, Mr. and Mrs. Seller. I want to support that. But I've got so much more access to so many different more markets because of what I do. I'm just saying, if I can sell it, you're going to give me a piece of it. Can we agree on that? And I'm still allowing you the right to sell it yourself. So if that's one of the conditions of it, though, is it's only an exclusive agency, which simply means they're not hiring any other practitioners. Like if it was an open agency, they could hire 50 people to do the same thing and still reserve the right to sell it themselves. But they've exclusively contracted with you along with their own marketing efforts to list the property. So if the son does say, no, nah, I think I can do it on my own, you could still continue to try and find a buyer for it. And again, this is where we get into more procuring cause issues is you've got to keep accurate, accurate, accurate documents of, you know, when, when people come by, because the, the crux of, um, of procuring cause is, was it because of your marketing efforts that helped to facilitate the sale was, was the actual cause of the sale? So, you know, every time somebody comes by, I mean, you're always, hey, they called my number, I took them to the house, that kind of thing. And that's where you have to be a little bit more careful. But I think you probably won't even have that much of an issue. It doesn't sound like um, she understands how to sell a house. A lot of for sale by owners think they just have to put a sign out. And when we were in a much more active market, some of that was true for sure. But um, yeah, not the case. But unfortunately, you can't get paid if they, in fact, are the ones who uh, bring someone that affects the sale of the property. You're like, I didn't want to hear that, D. That wasn't the best news I wanted to hear. Um, did that answer your question, Donna? Oh, sorry. I muted myself. Um, yeah, we go. I, have, I have an exclusive right to sell, though. Isn't that 
Isn't that different? Isn't that, I mean, that's a regular no, contract. No, that have no. a regular contract is an exclusive authorization and right to sell. That's what you have? Right. Yes. So, okay, so then you don't have an exclusive agency. Right. So exclusive. how is she still existing as a FISBO? She refuses to take down her, her uh, Zillow listing and uh, is taking calls from people. Does she understand that she's not a FISBO? She may not. So this is where you might get into some uh, some contractual flow. Is she may not understand that she is no longer a FISBO because there is no refusing to take down my signs or anything like that. In in mm -hmm. that sense, um, you know, it's just a matter of junk in the yard essentially because you've now taken over. You're the one driving, even though she's sitting in the passenger seat with a plastic wheel. She's not actually piloting the car. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So you may need to articulate that to her a little bit more clearly. How long okay. was your contract for? Um, until August. Okay. Yeah, you definitely. So I would do this. Um, mm -hmm. And anybody else in the room, feel free to jump in. But what I would do is I would reach out to her. I would ask uh, or tell her what a great idea can you, me, and your son all get in the same room, and that way you've got a better flow or a better better handle of what her a true intention is, and that she fully understands that you executed a listing agreement that no longer allows her to be a um, for sale by owner. Okay. Okay. Yeah, because those things can get sticky. You know, that's one thing. I mean, I've been. I've been to so many mediations and arbitrations in my career with agents. And sometimes it's just that little twist of, and sometimes the arbiter I've had, I can think of a specific situation and it was such a pointed question from the arbiter um, where he's like, did she understand that this thing was this thing? And, you know, the agent kind of bounced around and went, well, so what? And, you know, clearly it wasn't a definite yes. And that one thing turned against that particular agent. So okay. just making sure that they know. All right, um, guys, I'm just going to cover a couple of things. Normally we have a different presentation, but I, I wanted today because format wise, we're going to be adjusting this train up series going forward. Um, you know, we've talked openly as a, as a, uh, as a company about kind of how we want to really embrace um, training opportunities for everyone. And certainly, you know, everybody's familiar with pedagogy, but the way people learn is layered. You know, it's auditory, it's tactile, it's, you know, visual. There's a lot of different ways in terms of how people learn or retain information. Um, historically, we've always done these half hour, 45 minute hour kind of presentations. And that's, that's pretty germane across the industry. But we're going to start to adjust more specifically to daily bite-sized nuggets or kernels of information, followed by um, active open forums to where you guys can share experiences like you're doing right now, Donna, um, share individual issues based on the subject matter that we're talking about for that day. Um, and that way we can learn as a collective. That way, you know, just like our networking platform in, in um, the community or on the dashboard, it allows us to, to function as a group, more of a hive mentality in the sense to where we're all kind of learning in real time and sharing experiences. Um, you know, never ever do we stop at, you know, I'm the ultimate voice of reason or someone who's conducting a room, but it literally is that we're sharing the experiences of our collective experience to make sure that we're getting the right outcomes each and every time. I'm going to call on, and I want to say it's Lada. Uh, I may be saying that correctly, Lada. I may not be. But uh, I was just going to say hi. Welcome to the room. I haven't seen you before. Ian, it's good to see you, man. How's it going? Okay. Donna, am I frozen? Can you hear me? No, I can hear you fine. Okay, just making sure. Yeah, sometimes my screen, I'm sure we've all had that experience since we've been in Zoom or Zoom-like rooms, which is it'll just freeze and you're talking to yourself for 10 minutes and you're going, is anybody there? No? Oh, just me? Oh, okay. So, but today what I wanted to talk about, so I talk a lot about different negotiation styles and things that exist 
um, within the dynamics of negotiating every day. Um, I, I, per, I personally think it's super important to understand the principles and concepts of everything that we do, um, only because in real estate, real estate is one of those very true businesses or true business models to where we spend a lot of time in what's called the social principle or the herd mentality, to where we follow other practitioners or other people doing a certain task or behavior because we think that's what's supposed to do. And if everybody's doing it, it must be the right thing. And all too often, it's not the right thing. And it's only because real estate is one of those businesses that, as we all know, has an initial low barrier of entry to get a license, a professional license, not a certification, but things that can actually impact other people in a very significant way. But then there's very little to no training beyond that. Um, and that's a flaw of the industry in a sense, because we look at it as a self-guided business. But uh, in truth, it's it's like any other licensed profession. There's a lot of additional post-license training that's necessary to be proficient and have a positive outcome. So um, I try and teach or instruct towards um, actually learning concepts and principles um, from a behavioral foundation, I think. Uh, a few of you know, at least that that's my background. You know, I worked in psychiatry before I got into real estate. And so I approach almost everything I do from a behavioral standpoint. Um, but, you know, that being said, you know, as it comes to training, as it c comes to leveling up or, or, or growth in terms of um, what we do from a practice, um, I like to give you foundational principles. That way, when you're exercising them, you know you're exercising them and you can improve upon those and it actually increases your skill dynamic um, because you literally are in control or in command of the tool that you're using. So today I wanted to talk very briefly about, and I was just sharing this with Donna, about agreement zones and kind of why is that important and how does that affect our day-to-day -day relationships? So we do, in fact, exercise agreement zones every single day, you know, in our personal lives, uh, when we're meeting others um, casually, formally, um, from a business perspective, we exercise these agreement zones. And the reason why it's important to understand them is because as you're guiding yourself through the negotiation and utilizing scripts and dialogues and various different closes and understanding what the true wants and need dynamic is of that negotiation, Understanding what an agreement zone looks like helps you to facilitate the close much more readily, much more quickly. Um, you know, sometimes we take in surface information and we hold on to it so tightly that we don't fully understand what the negotiation is. We're just looking for the yes. No matter how we got there, we're looking for the yes. And, you know, there are all kinds of things that get us there. Sometimes we just yield to get the yes. Sometimes we uh, we battle to get the yes, but you know, if, if you understand the concept of the agreement zone, um, then it'll help you to a not give up so much. Um, one crucial thing I can think of right off the bat is how we, um, or some of us—I'm not saying all of us—but how we'll quickly give up commission. Um, commission is a hotly debated topic in this day and age, uh, primarily because um, there's a lot of um, legislative eyeballs on us and consumer eyeballs on us about being this antitrust um, kind of uh, kind of industry that we monopolize and we essentially price fix and force people into commissions. And on, I was going to say on some levels, there may be a grain or a kernel of, of reality to that, but not so much. It's any industry can design a um, a standard, if you will, of what should be charged. And historically, particularly when real estate was a very proprietary business, uh, you know, it was very easy to say, I want this much money and this is why. And we really didn't even have to substantiate or justify the why. It was like, that's just what it is. Once we... Um, became a non-proprietary business, you know, through the internet age where people didn't have to come to us and they could get access to similar information that we had or sometimes the same, exact same, um, we still carried over a similar model. So when we talk about 
negotiating for our commission, um, that's when we truly get into um, some of that um, some of that uh, agreement zone. But when you look at you know, and there, there's actually six strategies, but there are four simple strategies or four stages that we look at when we talk about negotiation, and that's exploration, bidding. Um, uh, bargaining and and settling. That's kind of where we get into. Um, the, the one thing that we always want to stay away from, at least most of us do, is the is the uh, negotiation around our money. you know so we part of how we get there is that agreement zone, which is you know what you want and why. And this is when we always talk about exercising our true value proposition and this is what I was saying to you earlier, Donna, is she doesn't understand, your true value. And that's why I was saying you sit in that, that, um, that price heuretic, you know, that uh, she doesn't understand that you're bringing so much more to the table than just being that agent, you know, just that person who, you know, puts a sign out and that's it. And that's why I said, she probably doesn't understand that you're in it for the hall. You're the one who's kind of going, no, no, let me take a hold of this. I've got you. So the way, um, the way, um, the uh, acceptability zone works is essentially, I mean, it's, it is what it sounds like. There's typically a scale or an expected range that someone sits in or sits under. And Donna, you identified this with her just recently, which is that expected range is, I don't really know what I want. I just want to be able to give my heir whatever this is, which is why she's willing to concess and say, if I can't get what I think it should be, I'm just going to give it to my son and let him handle it because it sounds like he's ultimately going to be the one to benefit from it. So that expected range is kind of much narrower than what you would expect. So you guys are kind of in that um, no agreement space because it's not a zone of acceptability or a zone of agreement more specifically for you. You're not in that zone of agreement because you're like, wait a minute, I'm doing these things. And she's just like, no, 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 no. That's not what we're doing at all. Does that sound familiar, Donna? So you have what's called an agreement gap. And that agreement gap is when there's an overlap of what's expected or the effective agreement and, you know, a, a truly satisfactorily uh, satisfactory conclusion. So you've done, you know, what you think in your head, which is, hey, I found somebody to purchase this property, Mrs. Seller. And Mrs. Sellers going, nope, I don't want to accept that at all because that's not what I'm looking for. And that's causing, you know, obviously consternation and confusion for you. So, you know, how do we bridge an agreement gap? One, which is, you know, compromise. A person moves outside of their zone of acceptability. And right now, Donna, you're taking onus of that zone of acceptability. You're the one tackling it, kind of going, well, maybe I'll do this, right? Because you're clearly not in agreement. Um, ideally, it'd be great if both people compromise. Um, and that's because initially neither one of you um, really defined your zone of acceptability. And so we're bringing in a third party in this case, which is the child. And again, the child may be, or the heir, I should say more specifically. And the heir may be, as we said, that person who is the true decision maker. Um, you know, but you definitely don't want it in that agreement gap to get to where neither party is willing to concess. And then we walk away, you know, with that frustration and we've all been there, right? We've all kind of hit that, uh, lack of desirable bearability to where we just ended up saying, screw it. I left because my seller's crazy or, you know, my buyer just didn't want to do what I, you know, told him to do or what I felt was necessary for them to move forward. So, you know, that's one of those very simple things that we deal with every day. And it's important to know where we are in that process or in our role, what stage we are there, because then we can make some cognitive adjustments in real time versus, you know, employing frustration or um, um lack of uh, ability to move forward in that. It allows us to kind of step back, regroup. Um, address the party that we're negotiating with in a different manner and then come to an agreement. Because basically what we end up doing at that stage is we restate uh, everything that we talked about from the opening to make sure that the communication was clear, that all the agreements that were established in that opening, um, uh, in that opening, in that introduction 
um, we're clear and specific in it, in, you know, clear, clears up any cloud or confusion that happened. So, you know, let me ask this. Let me backtrack a little bit. And this is for the group. What What is a negotiation? I, I know everybody has a different definition of it, but I'd like to make sure, you know, as I'm talking through this, everybody understands what a negotiation truly is. Anybody want to jump in? Because I can definitely give you my view. It's finding a middle ground that's acceptable to both parties. Okay. So I, what I think a negotiation is, is it's the process of influencing, influencing someone to get what you want. Because uh, that's what it is at the end of the day, right? I mean, we, you know me. I talk a lot about the win-win strategy. Um, but it, it really is, at the end of the day, if you think about what the negotiation is, and think about the last time you negotiated with Jason, Donna, right? It wasn't, it wasn't so Jason can get what he wants and you get what you want. It was like, I want this thing, right? And it's not all the time that we have those negotiations. But at the end of the day, that's essentially what the negotiation is. It's a matter of getting kind of what you want, um, which is why we have to establish that zone of acceptability because we may not get there. It may be that that person gives us push or, you know, uh, doesn't exactly align with what our thinking is. And a, a more specific way, and this is what you were just talking about, Donna, is a negotiation is is kind of viewed as a um, as a joint communication process. So, you know, we, we're always trying to reach that agreement, um, you know, particularly when there's an exchange of something that takes place. In our world, you know, any real estate contract we sign is a personal service agreement. And it's both parties. It's always bilateral. It's what um, what I promise I'm going to do for you and what you're going to do for me. Nine times out of 10 for us, it's I promise I'm going to find a buyer to meet all the terms and conditions that you're wanting in order to sell this property. And your agreement to me is you promise to pay me. You know, that's why we, we kind of create that contract. And in that contract, neither party can cancel arbitrarily. They can't just say, no, nope, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm out. Um, because we know contractually we're bound by the terms of what's in the language there. So that's when a um, uh, when it, when a zone of acceptability becomes even more uh, even more critical is because we reach these states and we we've, we've all been here, I'm sure of it, to where the seller may feel like you're not performing to uh, reach what their agreement was or what they stated that they wanted and you absolutely feel like you want and they want to fire you or they feel like they want to go with someone else because either action isn't happening quickly enough or they're not getting the desired outcome as they see it and it could be because the market is not supporting what their stated desired outcome is. As a matter of fact, I think we, uh, some of you have experienced this just recently as we were coming out of a, a very frenetic market and transitioning into a more um, buyer centric. It's not exactly a buyer's market, but there was definitely some concessions that happened from the sell side, but you had a lot of sellers who absolutely categorically said, no, nope, I'm not doing that because I know my friend just sold their house in November for a million six and we're in the same block, same floor plan. It's not November, right? And that's the thing. So sellers get stuck on the past way too often. And sometimes we don't always have the tools to, to move them forward. So, I mean, if we think of the negotiation as a joint communication process and that win-win dynamic is always kind of an equal partnership, then where do we sit on the range of, of, of acceptability? And also, how short or how wide as a practitioner is your range of acceptability? You know, how much are you willing to concess? I see agents, um, we were talking about um, uh, commission. I see agents literally give up money um, before a seller even objects to it, right? Their agreement zone is all off. They've got this wide thing. And there are many reasons why we do it. It could be because we haven't had a commission in a while. It could be because, um, you know, we know that um, the market is changing and, you know, you just want to get this one out of your belt and you want it to get into the neighborhood for a while. There's a lot of reasons why we do it. Some of it's just lack of experience or not understanding what our value proposition is. So it makes it difficult for us to actually stand our ground or present with confidence 
when we're doing the listing presentation. So, you know, it's a range of, of reasons this happens, but um, you've got to be, you've got to be aware of how you bridge your agreement gaps um, because it, it, it happens often. And, you know, again, Don, I'm picking on you on this one just because you brought up such a brilliant uh, point and, you know, such a useful point and things that happen on a daily basis. So that's what I wanted to cover today. Um, I'm not going to spend a lot of time in other concepts today, but, you know, certainly we'll talk about it in future groups. Um, and I'm going to open this up to the floor if you've got questions or things that you want to add. Um, otherwise, um, I'll go ahead and give some time back to everybody um, for your Friday and we go from there. Anybody have anything that they want to add? Uh, any experiences that they want to share and how this might be relevant or vital to what you do on a daily? Okay. Awesome. Well, guys, as always, I truly appreciate your participation and your attendance in these things. Um, you know, as I always say, it says a lot about you that you're willing to take time out of your day to invest in you and, you know, get some ideas or share ideas. Um, those are things that continue to drive us all forward yeah, every single day. So truly appreciate your time. Um, I hope you guys have a successful and productive weekend uh, for our California folks on this. Um, certainly we've got some rain throughout, uh, not rain, sunshine throughout most of the state. We've had rain, you know, days and days, but uh, we've got some sunshine on, on this weekend. So definitely all enjoy a little bit of it. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Talk to you soon. See you next week.